Um, so I think the first time I talked about that was uh, in the Brazil-India conference seven years ago when we were in Rio. So uh, I'll divide my talk in um, four parts. So first I will uh, describe a problem. Then I'll try to present how one would solve this problem, what is this, how you can formulate more precisely uh, this problem. And then I will start uh, trying solving or presenting some, uh, so some, um, some ideas of the proofs. So the model I want to present here, it's a zero range process. So let me describe it. Uh, let's say that you have a finite torus with L points, so which I'm representing by TL. And you have particles evolving in this torus. So there is no restriction about the number of particles at each side. And I will represent the configurations by eta. So eta x will represent the number of particles at site x. And the dynamics will be described by two parameters. So I have g, which is a rate function, which is strictly positive and zero at zero. And then I have a p, which uh, will tell me how the particles will jump to the right and to the left. And the dynamics is as follows. Well, if you have at a certain time eta x particles, one of them will jump with rate g of eta x times p to the right and g times eta, g of eta x times one minus p to the left. So g of eta x will tell you the rate at which particles jump and p uh, will tell you the rate at which particle jump to the right or to the left. So this is the rate at which one particle jump. So if you think uh, that you divide the gk by k, if uh, there are k particles, each of them is jumping with rate gk divided by k, which means that if you take gk equal to k, um, this ratio is one, so you have independent particles moving on this torus, while if you take gk equal to one, you can think that uh, you have servers and queues. On each line, you have a server, so you have clients. This <coughs> server is giving service which have uh, exponential times of rate one at the end of which the client jumps to the right or to the left. So this is, uh, this is the model. Okay. Well, I will be interested in one special uh, family in which uh, g of k is given by k to divided by k minus one to the power alpha, where alpha is a fixed parameter, strictly positive. So you see here that uh, this rate is decreasing, decreasing to one as k goes to infinity. So the more you have particles at one side, the smaller is the rate at which these particles jump. But this uh, asymptotic rate is not converging to zero, it's converging to one, so to a strictly positive uh, constant. And the first question you might ask about um, this model, it's about the invariant measure. So let me tell you what are uh, the invariant measure. So let's fix a parameter, uh, phi, between zero and one. Uh, let's define z as by this series, which is just a renormalizing constant. And what I claim is that if you place at each side uh, k particles with uh, this probability, then uh, this measure, and you do that independently at each side, then this product measure, it's an invariant measure for that uh, model. So you have a family indexed by this parameter phi <coughs> of invariant states. What's um, uh, happening in this model is that, well, if I take the density, so there is a unique conserved quantity in this dynamics, which is the total number of particles. So let me call rho of phi the density of particles. Okay, so just the expectation under this measure nu phi of the uh, number of particles. Well, you can uh, show that rho phi is in fact given uh, by the derivative of the logarithm of z. And uh, let's see what happens with log of z. So I draw here um, pictures of the behavior of log of z. So you see that, well, if alpha is uh, smaller than one, well, as phi is converging to uh, its radius of convergence, which is one, um, this z of phi will converge to plus infinity. So here is, so log of z is converging to plus infinity as uh, phi is approaching 
to 1. While uh, if now alpha is between 1 and 2, what happens is that, well, uh, this series is convergence. So as phi converges to 1, z of phi will converge to a finite value. But if you take the derivative of z of phi, then this quantity will converge to plus infinity. So z of, log of z of phi is converging to a finite value at the radius of convergence, but the derivative is equal to plus infinity. Okay. While if uh, now alpha, you take alpha bigger than 2, then both z of phi and its derivative will converge to finite values. Okay, okay. and why um, I'm describing that? Because, well, yes, sure. Yeah, so here I'm taking a very special case uh, in which you have this phenomenon. Okay, so, so it with yes, it changed with uh, the parameter, it changed with the rate. So, there are, yeah, for some models, for instance, you don't have this phase transition happening. But for that specific um, model, you have these phenomena. And what I want to, to, uh, to present is how these um, phase transition will affect the stationary state. So, as I said, you have a conserved quantity, which is the total number of particles. So, L is representing here the total number of sites, and N will represent the total number of particles. When you fix the total number of particles, you have a reducible Markov chain, so it has a unique stationary state, which I will be representing by mu Ln. And um, what we would like to describe is the behavior of this stationary state in the thermodynamical limit. So I'll take L, the total number of sites growing to plus infinity, and I will fix a density. So I'll fix a row. <coughs> And I'll send L to infinity and N to infinity in such a way that density, which is N divided by L, is converging to rho. Okay? And, uh, well, what's happening, the equivalence of ensembles tells you that, well, if you take a density which is smaller than the critical density, I'll show you that there exists a critical density, that if you take a density which is smaller than that, then that critical density, if you look locally, so if you fix a three or four states, three or four sites, if you look locally on these three or four sites, well, as L is increasing to plus infinity, uh, this measure is converging to uh, one of these uh, grand canonical measures in which uh, parameter phi will be exactly the one which gives you density rho. So this happens uh, below this uh, critical density. While if you take now a density rho which is above uh, the critical density, what happens the following? Well, you have these L sites. You have particles distributed in these L sites. Choose the site in which you have the more particles. Remove that site. If you remove that site and if you observe the L minus 1 remaining sites, what you observe is that your measure is converging to this uh, measure with the critical density rho star. Well, but since the critical density is smaller than the total density, this means that in this site which we removed, you removed a macroscopic quantity of particles, which means that in this stationary state, what you have is that in one site, you have a macroscopic quantity uh, of particles concentrated on that site, and in the remaining site, essentially a finite number of particles. So you have this uh, condensing phenomena in these stationary states. And this is called condensation and has been proved in several different um, papers by these authors. What I will be interested here is that uh, I will fix uh, alpha strictly bigger than one. The total number of sites will be fixed for the remaining of the talk. So L, the number of sites will be fixed. And I'm sending the total number of particles to infinity. And what we can prove, which translates what I described informally, is that, well, there exists a site in which you have more than n minus ln particles with probability asymptotically equal to 1, which means that fix any sequence which is converging to plus infinity but smaller than n, then there is one site which has at least n minus ln particles with probability uh, almost equal to 1. Okay, once you know that, so this is a description of the stationary state. So there are many natural questions which arise once you, you prove that. First question will be how uh, nucleation occurs. 
So let's say that you distribute evenly particles among all L sites. You let the process evolve. Since the stationary state is concentrated on configuration in which essentially all particles are on one site, well, how the system will drive you through uh, this state. So this is the nucleation uh, phase. And then there is a second question, which is also natural. Well, assume that all particles are concentrated on one site. Let the system evolve. But you expect that at some later time, these all particles will be concentrated on another site. Well, how long do you have to wait in order to see uh, this transition? And let's say that you started with a system in this torus, which is next uh, neighbors, which jumps only to the next neighbors. Well, is this pile of particles will jump, be jumping to the next neighbors? Will they jump to, um, well, how is the distribution which will describe the evolution of this condensate? So these are the two questions one would like. So I'll concentrate on the second one, so the evolution of the condensate. So how do you describe the evolution of the condensate? Well, so let me introduce uh, this notation. So if I fix a site K, I will represent by EK the configurations in which essentially all particles at, are at site K. So these are, of course, uh, sets which are, have no intersection. And let me call uh, delta N what remains. So the configurations which are not uh, in one of these sets. So here's a picture, so you have here four, five sites. In red, you have the configuration in which essentially all particles are at one site. So what you expect, since the stationary measure is concentrated on this configuration, is that if you start on one of these sets, you will remain in this set for a very long time. And then at a certain time, you will um, make a transition to another of these sets. This transition will be uh, fast compared to the time you remained on one set. So how uh, do you describe this evolution? So this is my problem. So let's, uh, well, natural idea is to project. Okay. So let me introduce a function, psi, which will tell you uh, in which of these sets you are. So if your configuration has essentially all particles at site k, well, let's project this configuration to point k. And you do that for uh, k from 1 to l. And if you are outside, so if you are uh, in one of these configurations in which you have particles everywhere, let's uh, project it to 0. So let's, this is uh, my projection psi n. And now let me call xn uh, the evolution of this uh, function, which I'm calling a slow variable, because in order to observe an evolution of this uh, psi n, I have to wait very, very long time. So the typical behavior will be that, well, let's say that you start from set EN1, E1. So you will remain that for a very long time, which I'm calling theta N. At certain point, you will reach the boundary of this set. And at the boundary of this set, you'll start uh, visiting delta N, coming back, visiting, coming back. So this is represented by here. So you have an erratic uh, behavior of this projection when you reach the boundary. So maybe you decided to go back to the site E1, the set E1, you remain there a very long time. Here again, you reach the boundary, so you go back and forth through the boundary up to a point in which you decide to visit another set E3, in which you remain a very long time. So this is, will be a typical trajectory of uh, the process X and T. And you see that with such a trajectory, you can't expect convergence in the score topology due to this um, uh, behavior on uh, the boundaries. Theta n, it's a time scale, which uh, we'll have to find. So this is a time behavior of x and t. Okay, you remain a very long time to on one of these sets, then you, well, you start visiting the bound, the set delta n, and come back, and then you remain. Okay, so well, this is um, how x and t. So how can you? Um, Yeah, because, so you have these sets e, E1, E2, and so on. 1, E2, where essentially all, so these are sets in which essentially all particles are set E1, E2, E2 in 2. So when you reach the boundary, you will go back and forth. So your process X and T will jump from 0 to 1. 
And this will happen in a scale which is much smaller than the scale theta, theta n. And this is what I'm representing here, just that you're going back and forth. Yeah, yeah. In fact, not only on the boundary, but on what I'm calling delta n, which is uh, everything which is in between. So the idea is to do some um, surgery here and to remove these, um, these intervals. So how you do the, how you remove these intervals? By considering the trace process. So let me define uh, the trace of a Markov process on a subset F. So assume that you have a Markov process which takes value on E. Take a subset F. So I'll represent by eta F the trace of this process on the set F. So here's a picture. So let's assume that F is a set AB here. And here's a trajectory. So you stay at time T1 on point A, then you jumped, you jumped, came back to A, T2, you st stay there at T2, you jumped, came to B, T3, and so on. So what you do is remove everything which is outside A and B, and you uh, move backward the trajectory in which to reach that trajectory. So this is uh, the new trajectory of the trees. Okay, so this is an informal description. So let me just uh, be slightly more rigorous. So how you do that? Well, let me define by uh, TF the time the process spent on set F between 0 and T. And let me represent by SF the inverse of TF. So here is um, one example of T. So you stayed on the set F. So this increased linearly. At this point, you le left set F. And at this point, you came back to set F. So your function started to increase linearly again, and so on. So what you're doing here is that for the trace process, you're just changing time and following time here. So when you reach that point, you just jump to that point. Okay. So this trace is just changing, um, make a change of time. And what's uh, very nice, it's, um, well, that these, these inverse are in fact stopping times, which means that uh, if you started from a Markov chain, the trace, which is given by this object, it's a new Markov chain with respect to a new um, filtration, the filtration given by the filtration of these uh, stopping times. And if you have a martingale with respect to the original filtration, then the change of time of that martingale, it's a new martingale with respect to the new, um, to the new. So the two properties of uh, Markov process and martingales are preserved by this change of time. The problem is that if you take, let's say, uh, a Markov chain, if you compute the rate jumps of this trace process, well, the rate jumps are complicated to compute since they are given by heating times. So you can express the rate of the trace process, the rate at which you jump from x to y, as well the holding time of the original chain times the probability that starting from x, the original chain will reach the set f minus x at y. So these are the heating times. Okay. So while does to say that the trace process is a Markov chain, the rates, the jump rates of this Markov chain are, are complicated to compute. They are given by explicit expression. So the idea of the trace process is just, uh, well, to remove, if you take the trace process on these, uh, the union of these sets, you're just removing uh, these inconvenient. Um, no, no, you, diffusions and so on. It's absolutely general. Okay, so what, uh, so what's the idea? What we would like to prove? Well, <coughs> let's take the trace. Let's project the trace. And let's prove that in some time scale theta n, the projection of the trace will converge to some Markov chain. And let's also prove that uh, the amount you removed from the, your trajectory, so the total amount of time you stayed on the set delta n, it's small. So these are the two uh, statements we would like to prove. 
so that the slow variables for the trace process will converge to some Markov chain, finite state Markov chain, and that the total amount you state outside one of these sets is very small. Well, if you don't like uh, these two statements, because they are referring to a trace process, well, it's possible to prove either to introduce a topology which allows these jumps uh, in which you have convergence of the original, of the projection of the original process, or you can also prove that uh, the finite dimensional distributions are converging, or you can even prove that um, if you start from some configuration and you let time evolve for the original process, then at some uh, time t in the scale theta n, well, the state of your process, of the original process, it's a combination of local stationary state. So pi k will be, you take the invariant measure of the original process, you condition it to be in one of these sets, E1, E2. So these are the pk. So we can show that the state of your process at time t, it's a convex combination of these states. If you can prove, so these are consequences of these two facts with uh, some more uh, hypotheses. Okay. So this is what um, we would like to prove. So let's see how, how one can prove that. So this is what uh, we would like to prove. <coughs> so you have a, a Markov process and you want to, well, this is a Markov process. You projected the Markov process, so you have a hidden Markov process in which you want to prove that it converts to a Markov process. How you do that? Well, you prove tightness and then you prove uh, uniqueness. To prove uniqueness, so let me skip tightness. Uh, the way you prove tightness is essentially the same way you, in which you prove uniqueness. To prove uniqueness, what you'll show is that uh, the limiting process solves a martingale problem. Okay, so you have to show that there exists a, an operator L, which is a generator for which this object is a martingale uh, for any function F. Well, in the case of uh, finite state Markov process, the typical generator is written this way. So this is what uh, we need to prove, which is written here. So, well, what do you know? You know that the trace process, it's a Markov chain. So if I take any function h, uh, this object, and if I represent by Le the generator of the trace process, this object is a Markov So let me represent by Re the rate of the trace process, which are given by this uh, jump hitting times. Okay. So we know that this object here, it's a Martin game. So if I uh, compute, well, I replace h by the composition of a function f with uh, the projection. What I get is that, well, f psi computed at eta, this will give me exactly f of xn. Then h, if, if again, if h is f composed with psi psi at eta e, it's x. So here I'll get f of x. And what remains here is that uh, the generator of the trace applied to this function f composed with psi. And the problem is that you have to show that this, uh, this integral is converging to that, uh, to that integral. <coughs> so let me compute that uh, to show what is the real problem. So you want to uh, compute the generator of the trace process applied to this function f psi, f phi. <coughs> well, it's a Markov process, so this is just the rates multiplying the difference. f phi of eta, it's f of x. And here you have a sum over all psi. Well, let's divide this sum for all psi in e k. So if psi is in k, f composed with phi at xi, it's fk. So you have this difference. And here remains, well, the rate at which for the trace process, you jump from eta to one configuration in eta k, k for which I'm representing by that object. So this is the expression which you need to show that converts to that. So this is an expression which depends on the configuration where you are, and you want to replace this uh, function by this average, because this function here, it's constant on each uh, set ek. So what we need to do, it's a replacement lemma, showing that, well, you can 
replace a function which depends on a configuration by a function which depends only on a set. So it's a local ergodic theorem which, uh, which appears, for instance, in a hydrodynamical limit when you want to close your equation uh, to get that your empirical measure converged to a solution of a PDE. You have to, um, to do a similar thing here, so to prove a local ergodic theorem. And how do we uh, prove that? Well, by using potential theory. So let me just uh, remind you quickly um, about um, potential theory. So you have a Markov process, and these heating times appear with rarity. So H A is representing the first time you hit the set A. Let me introduce the equilibrium potential. So this is um, you fix two sets with no intersection, and you call uh, V A B the equilibrium potential, which means that the probability that starting from eta you will reach A before B. So this equilibrium potential is the solution of the uh, harmonic equation. So it's an harmonic function outside A and B. Of course, it's equal to one if you are at A, and it's zero if you are at B. So you can show that it's the unique solution uh, of this equation. Okay. And once you have this equilibrium potential, let me call the capacity between A and B as the Dirichlet form of this um, equilibrium potential. Okay. So you have uh, the equilibrium potential, and you have the uh, capacity, which is the energy of this equilibrium potential. What uh, we proved with Beltran is that um, we formulated some conditions involving only the capacities and the stationary state, which are sufficient to entail this uh, replacement lemma. So, for instance, if we can prove that uh, in all sets EK, you have a configuration, which I'm calling psi K, which has the following property. Well, if you compute the capacity between EK and all other sets, so the union of all the other uh, metastable sets EJ, and if this capacity is small compared to the capacity between two configurations in the same set, EK, well, then you are able to prove the replacement lemma I refer to. So the replacement lemma is reduced to a computation of capacity, an estimation of capacities. Moreover, Yes. Yes. So uh, this is. I mean, so Bovier used uh, this metastability to compute transition times and to compute. Um, so it's in the spirit of that. Yes. Moreover, uh, in the reversible case, you can uh, express the asymptotic jump rates. So the rate at which you jump from a set EJ to a set EK in terms of capacities. So if you're able to compute the capacities, you know exactly what are the rates at which um, the asymptotic process which describes the evolution among these wells evolves, in the irreversible case at least. And also you can show uh, that the time you spend on the set delta N, it's a very small in the scale theta N, if you're able to prove that uh, the measure of this at delta n compared to the measure of any well converged to zero. Okay. So we have a set of conditions involving only capacity and the stationary state to guarantee not only um, the replacement lemma, but also the fact that you don't spend too much time outside one of these wells. Well, so everything depends, relies on capacities, and what's very nice, the, is that you have variational formulas for the capacities. So in the worst built case, you have what's called the Dirichlet principle, which expresses you the capacity as the infimum of the Dirichlet form over all functions f, which are equal to one on set A and equal to zero on set B. This has been um, generalized for the non-reversible case. So in the non-reversible case, you can express your capacity in terms of a double variational formula but I will not spend time to that because uh, I want to express the capacity in terms of flows. So let me uh, define flows. So we have a Markov chain on a set E. Uh, on a set E, so let me denote now by uh, this bold E, the set of edges. 
So these are all pairs, eta, xi, for which you can jump either from eta to xi or from xi to eta. So these are the edges. And a flow, it's a function defined on the edges, which is anti-symmetric. So phi of eta, xi, it's equal to minus phi xi eta. And I'll call the divergence of the flow, well, just at the point, at the configuration eta, it's just a sum over all xi of phi eta xi. Okay, so let's represent here, you have a configuration eta. So I want to express that instead of, uh, instead of arrows. So let's say that here it's uh, eta. These are the neighbors of eta, the xi's. And you have the value of phi of eta xi on all of these edges. Well, what I will do is the following. Whenever I have a positive value, I'll just draw an arrow from eta to xi. And when it's negative, I'll draw an arrow from xi to eta. And saying that the divergence is free, just saying that what's entering is flowing out. So in that case, well, what's entering here is 1 plus 2 plus 3, which is 6. And what's flowing out is 6. So this is uh, divergence free at that point. OK? And let me represent by FSAB the flows from A to B, which have strength S. This means that outside A and B, they are divergence free. So everything which is flowing in is flowing out outside in B. And the total flow going out from A is S. Well, and if you have S going out, you need S to enter B. So the total flow entering B will be minus S. Okay? So these are the flows from A to B of strength S. Sorry? At the rate, jump rate. Sorry. So these are just the random. Yeah, from one to the other, or from the other to the one. Okay, so la let's introduce a scalar product in these, the set of flows, which is given by uh, this object, where here I have the rate of the symmetric process. Okay, I'm symmetrizing, and I'm taking the symmetric rate. Well, and then we have a special, whenever I have a function f, I will define a special flow phi of f, which is given by uh, this expression. I'm just writing here the divergence of this flow, which is given by uh, the adjoint of, so L star will be the adjoint operator applied to F. So if F is harmonic with respect to the adjoint process at some point eta, this means that the divergence of the flow at that point is zero. Finally, let me represent by CAB all the functions which are equal on, to A on the set A and equal to B on the set B. So we have this formula for the capacity from A and B. This is the infimum over all flows, which have strength 0 from A to B, and the infimum of all functions, which are 1 at A and 0 at B. And what's nice of this formula is that it's represented as inf inf. So it's easy to compute upper bounds for that object. Okay. And if you find, so this holds in the non-reversible case. In the reversible case, this will give you exactly the Dirichlet principle. And you have a similar formula uh, for 1 over the capacity, which is also given by inf inf. But now you're taking uh, flows with strength 1 and functions which are 0 at a and b. And you know which, which are the minimizers. So once you know which are the minimizers, if you are in um, well, some problem, you need to compute the capacity, well, you just try to guess what is the harmonic function for the adjoint process and for the process, and you have candidates to insert in this variational form in order to get uh, good bounds for uh, the capacities. So this is, um, well, this has been implemented, I don't have too much time, in many different uh, examples in which you are able to compute um, the asymptotic behavior of this capacity and therefore to prove uh, the convergence of um, the projection of the trees and the fact that you don't spend too much time <coughs> on, um, on the component of the set. So to conclude, just uh, comments and some open problems. So these techniques using uh, potential theory instead of uh, large deviations can be applied to reversible and non-reversible dynamics, as we have seen that we have uh, variational formulas, nice variational formulas for um, the capacities. 
In this example which I presented, the Z-range process, the barriers are logarithmic inside, in height. Okay? So which means that, uh, for instance, the time at which you, time you need to go from one well to the other one, not exponentially large, but it's uh, polynomially large. In fact, it's equal to n to the power one plus alpha. So these um, techniques based on potential theory allow you to examine these models in which you don't have exponential barriers, but you have logarithmic barriers, in which um, the large deviation techniques will not um, be very useful. Um, when computing the time in which you need to go from one well to the other, um, if you have exponential barriers, you need to compute the prefactor. And so this potential theory uh, allows you to compute uh, these uh, uh, prefactors. However, um, so when metastability was introduced in the 80s, they were very much concerned on the typical path which will make the transition from one well to the other. Okay, these techniques do not say anything about uh, the typical path. They just tell you uh, that the transition is very fast because uh, the time you spend on the set delta n, it's very small in that scale theta n. So you know that the transition is very fast, but you don't know which is the typical path in which you go from one to the other. So here's the, um, the result for the zero-range process. So what we can prove is that in this time scale, um, your, the, as I said, the projection of the trace will converge to some mark of chain, xt on the one L, in the reversible case, so even uh, the rate at which you jump from x to y, it's given by the capacity of the underlying Markov chain. So remember that we started with a process which was jumping to the right with probability 1 minus p and to the left with probability p. Well, if you take a more general case and you have L sites and you're allowed to jump from x to y, from any x to any y with certain rates, if it's reversible, uh, you can compute the, um, the rates of the asymptotic process, and they are given by the capacity of this uh, random walk, underlying random walk. So in the case in which uh, you jump one, one, one half, one half, um, the asymptotic rate at which uh, this pile of particles will jump to one set, one point to the other point, will decay as the inverse of the distance. So you're allowed to jump very far, but the rate at which you jump very far decays as uh, the inverse of the distance. In the non-reversible case, this has been proved only uh, in the case in which you jump only to the right, the totally asymmetric case. Then uh, the nucleation has been uh, studied. So when L is fixed, you know exactly how the process formed these piles. But one open problem which I think will be very interesting to examine is, uh, well, let's say that you start with L sites and with a supercritical density, so you let the system evolve, and you let L to increase together with time. And you'd like to see how these piles are formed. So you expect that in the limit, you'll observe some all self-similar process, which uh, would be very nice to describe. As I said, in the asymmetric case, the evolution of the Z-range is not known. And one uh, general, so these questions have been applied to recently to diffusions. So one interesting question uh, which uh, one can try to solve, it's um, to study the stationary state. So you know that uh, if you, you consider diffusion, uh, you can prove the large deviations. And from the large deviations, you can obtain information about the quasi-potential, which gives you the, uh, the form of the stationary measure. Well, maybe using potential theory, you can get some information about the uh, second order term in this expansion of the um, large deviation functional. So this will be the prefactor of um, the stationary state. And uh, well, so this is one uh, one interesting question. And I think also. Can you, comment, can you comment a bit more on that? So, because there's a lot here. In particular, uh, so for, for random polymers, what has been, or are you saying that metastable questions have been solved with this technique for random polymers? 
Special case. So uh, two models, one which was considered by uh, Fabio Martinelli and many others, which you have a repulsive and you go back and down. So for this model you can uh, apply not potential theory because there you, but you can, um, you can express, though you don't have an explicit formula for T time. So sometimes these, uh, the time it takes to go from one world to the other, it's given by implicit formula, which is the case in that model. In that model, I mean, one of the problems that still is very difficult to deal with if you have some disorder on your problem, it will be going to be uh, yeah. very hard. Um, yeah, okay. I, 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 Um, did I understand correctly that the typical time it takes to leave one of the state does not depend on the state? That the theta n are more or less the same? Yeah, because here we have the symmetry. It's a symmetry. So, so it makes the rescaling in time in order to converge in some sense uh, easy because you, it's whatever you, you have just to rescale the same time to, ch to, to end up with a jump process. So what, what my question is, because in, you know, in many situations, the scaling time to leave a metastable state uh, in some regime will depend uh, on the state, and then it's difficult to handle that. No, no. So. So, let's say that you take a diffusion with many wells of different depth. So what you have there is that you can get an entire description of several metastable states which have several different uh, depths. So if you take the shallower wells, you have for these shallow wells some typical uh, time scale in which you jump until you reach a very deeper well, which will be in this Markov chain, um, I call it absorbing point. And then you, if you want another, so you, now you have big, bigger, deeper wells, and for these deeper wells you have a new uh, time scale in which you jump. So you will have several, um, different descriptions up to the deepest ones in which you might not have uh, solving points. So you mentioned non-reversible diffusion. What kind of non-reversibility do you have in mind? <coughs> well, so you take a... Uh, Is it a general drift or do you mean... No, not the general drift because we, to compute the capacities and you need to know the stationary state, but you have some non-linear, some... Uh, non-reversible diffusions in which you know the United States. So you mean some, somehow a perturbation of the usual gradient case? Is so that something? Yeah, you take, a, let's say you take a potential. Yeah. So what you can do, you take a, a potential U. So you take a drift, which will be, you take an asymmetric matrix, and then you add something which might be orthogonal to uh, this object. 